Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, my name is Yash, and I'm an engineering student from Yale and a co-founder of the Intercollegiate Engineering Alliance. Before I introduce our fantastic speaker, I just want to mention the question and answer session after the presentation. Please send in your questions in the live event Q&A chat section anytime during the talk, and I will pose them to uh, Professor Hallett on your behalf. If you would like, feel free to include your name and where you're from or your university. But if you'd prefer to remain anonymous, that is completely fine as well. Now I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Jason Hallett is a faculty member of the Department of Chemical Engineering in Imperial College London. His research group explores the salvation behavior of ionic fluids and the use of ionic fluids in the production of biofuels, sustainable chemical feedstocks, vaccine manufacturing, and waste recycling. He's also a co-founder of Lixia, a company that is developing a sustainable biorefinery process using ionic liquids. Without further, further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Hallett. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, of course, and uh, excited to, to have the opportunity to talk at, uh, at sort of the inaugural conference, I guess, in, in what I hope will be a very long series. Um, so with, with that, I guess we can sort of get started. Um, the, the title of this is a little bit strange, right? It's uh, how, how to build a gig how, sorry, how not to build a gigantic laboratory process. Mostly out of a joke I often tell my students about um, about uh, how when researchers, laboratory researchers think about what process equipment will look like at scale, they just think of giant versions of the test tube, right? And so uh, instead of a distillation column, uh, they think about a huge rotary evaporator, that sort of thing. Most of the challenges in translating research from from a laboratory into a, a commercial practice um, is around the margins. It's the things that you don't think about, it's the things that you don't work on in a laboratory that, that trip you up. And so today I'm going to talk a bit about some of the experiences that I've had in this area. I've done a very strange thing. I've never done this before. Um, I've structured it such that I'm going to occasionally jump into small parts of the one minute commercial pitch that we give um, for several of my spin out companies. And so we're going to switch back and forth. Um, and part, part of that sort of to highlight the difference between how an academic thinks or how, how, a, how a, somebody who works in university thinks and how people in business have to think. Um, and so I think it will be quite interesting to, to show that, um, that dichotomy in, in slide presentation format. Um, I'm not an extraordinarily focused academic. So I work on a lot of different things. Part of that's because, as Josh said in the intro, um, I work on solution-based processing, which encompasses a lot of different fields. And so I don't have to be restricted by, you know, I work on catalysis for electrochemistry or something. Um, we can sort of do whatever. Um, it was a big attraction to me because I like to solve problems. And once the problem is solved, I kind of lose interest and look for something new to work on. Almost everything that I'm working on right now grew out of our research in biorefinery or biorefinery development. And I'll, I'll talk about that. It'll be the thread that ties everything together. And that was what led to the foundation of Lixia. Um, at heart of this, of course, is the use of ionic liquids in, in industry. And ionic liquids are not a large scale commercial solvent. They are a, so, <laughs> sort of quite a new um, solvent in, in academic terms, um, first went into sort of large scale use in the 1990s, um, but their application in industry has been rather limited. And there are eight commercial processes that utilize ionic liquids, but none of them use more than about one ton at a time, which is a quite small scale. They're not extremely complicated. They're just liquid salts. And so I 
I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about how wonderful they are, um, but just just to tell you, whenever I mention briefly an ionic liquid, um, it really is just an organic salt that acts as a solvent. As part of that biorefinery journey, we sort of devolved into the areas around the central application, which is where I'll start, which was um, the production of cellulose from biomass. And we started looking at protein stabilization to do biopatalysis. Um, and sort of a, this idea of a hybrid chemical biological process. So how do you put the two together? How do you marry um, bioprocessing into traditional uh, chemical applications? And weirdly enough, that worked so well that we ended up switching over and looking at vaccine formulations, which I'll discuss very, very briefly at the very, very end, um, only to, to tease you for the future. But I have put on this slide all of the things that, that, that I've been working on at the moment. Um, all of the applications, and I don't know, it's 20 or 30 different ones, um, spanning everything from, from vaccines to um, carbon capture to processing of sewage sludge, which is just exactly as disgusting as it sounds. Um, and, you know, everything in between, phytoremediation, battery recycling, all sorts of exciting things. But I've picked out today the topics that I thought you might be most interested in, which are the ones that have led to our academic spin-outs. And so along the way, I'll give you sort of a flavor for that. Um, so since I was asked to talk about biorefining and, and tech translation, um, I thought I'd start with, you know, you know, what is my experience in this area? So I am a professor at Imperial College. That is my job. Um, and but we have formed at the moment six spin out companies, um, the first one in 2016 and the most recent one last week. And these look at a lot of different areas. Um, somewhat tangential to biorefining to completely unrelated to it. But all of them are in the sustainability space. And so everything that, that we do um, is designed to lower the impact of human activity, especially manufacturing activity um, on, uh, on the planet. And I'll, I'll talk about each of these and how they pop up in the journey. Um, as I said, there are six of them. Five of them are mine and one of them is not. And you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see uh, quite clearly why why one of them uh, uh, had very little to do with me. So I'm not necessarily a traditional sustainability worker in the sense that I'm not really trying to stop climate change. Uh, I, I firmly believe that you can you can own your your motivation should always match your options. Actions. Your motivation should always match your actions. Thank you. Um, and the majority of carbon dioxide emissions are linked to the generation of electricity. I don't work on generation of electricity. So other than the, the occasional bits and pieces that we do on carbon capture, there's very little that I can do to um, mitigate climate change. You know, we, we, we can reduce chemical emissions, uh, sorry, CO2 emissions to some extent by building cleaner chemical processes, but it's quite limited. The petrochemical industry, petroleum refining, is only responsible for about a quarter of CO2 emissions. Um, and so it's quite difficult to argue that anything in that space is going to cause a 90% reduction in CO2 emissions. However, if we solve the renewable electricity problem with a combination of wind and solar and what have you, um, nuclear fusion, it doesn't matter, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to make stuff. And at the moment, everything that we make is a byproduct of petroleum refining. So everything that we make um, is something that was less well suited to be gasoline. And if we take away the massive uh, processing and drilling um, for petroleum, then we have no alternative means of large scale materials production. So we have no way of making polymers and plastics and petrochemicals and nutraceuticals and food additives and pharmaceuticals or anything, because those all come off of petroleum refining. And building up an alternative feedstock base is not simple. If we were decided to, to go all all in and uh, go for CO2 as our primary feedstock, um, we would need to increase the current electrical grid by approximately 30 times. And I don't think that that's a realistic goal to have happen in the next decade. What we can do in the next decade is switch over to biomass. This is something that we have utilized as a feedstock um, since the dawn of civilization. And so it isn't so difficult to envision us um, revisiting that a bit. What we're trying to do is switch the petroleum refining applications to lignocellulose as a feedstock, full stop. 
The problem that has plagued this uh, since its first proposal in the 1970s um, is that cellulosic biofuels, especially cellulosic ethanol, um, isn't economically competitive with petrol. It's far too easy um, to do petroleum refining at scale compared to large scale fermentation of sugar to make ethanol. If you want to do this from cellulose, the isolation of the cellulose is extraordinarily expensive. It's responsible for about 20% of the cost of, of biofuel production. And that is, that is an absolutely out of line with anything else that we do in the materials industry. And there are other sort of problems in terms of valorization of co-products and uh, feedstock acquisition, but or really the, the bottom line is it is a very inefficient process. Um, there's a, 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 an old process engineering joke that to a, a first approximation, any biorefinery looks like a wastewater treatment plant. And it's, it's not a bad point. There's so much water circulating around um, and so little product circulating around that it doesn't reflect traditional large scale chemical um, manufacturing where there is no water. There is very little solvent. M mostly you just do everything in the gas phase. And so I focused on trying to figure out what advantages biomass processing has and how we can take um, those advantages and, and sort of use them as a fulcrum to push the process through. Um, one, of course, is the generation of higher value products, which is somewhat easier from sugars. Um, and the other is to utilize sort of market forces, cheaper feedstocks. There's lots of waste out there that you can use. Stable prices is quite attractive. Uh, you know, everything from, from food um, to um, fuel um, tracks perfectly the current price of energy, except timber. So the one thing that does not, the one large scale commodity that does not have anything to do with the energy sector um, is trees because non-fertilized um, agricultural products um, have too long of a growth cycle to notice um, fluctuations in the price of energy. And so that's the sort of thing that you can take advantage of is, is the stability of, of the cost. I'm only going to do, I think, one, maybe two slides on the uh, technology itself. Um, you can you can take a, sort, certainly talk about it <laughs> extensively if you want in the Q&A. But um, why did I decide to use ionic liquids? It's very simple. They work better than everything else. The US Department of Energy, um, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, did a study with, I think they're up now to 38 different feedstocks. And they use between four and six pretreatment technologies in each one. And the ionic liquid gave the highest enzymatic sugar yield 38 out of 38 times. So why did we use it? Well, we're starting from a position of strength. So it is an outstanding way of getting sugars out of a tree. The difficulty is the ionic liquids cost a lot. And so it works really well. It's very, very efficient, but it's you know quite expensive. So it, it isn't... Uh, necessarily the most cost effective way of doing this. But ionic liquids are just organic salts, as I said earlier. So why don't we just mess around with the structure of the solvent until we find one that doesn't cost very much? And people in this field, people in my field, have messed around with the structure of ionic liquids for 30 years to make them do weird and odd and, and strange catalytic things. So why don't we just do the same approach? But instead of trying to affect a chemical action, why don't we try and affect an economic one? And so I don't we be quite smart about it. It's also quite fun because you can't normally mess around with, with organic solvents um, and have them do different things. Um, they stop behaving as solvents if you try. So this really recalcitrant biomass feedstock is annoying. Um, and the process that we developed, which the academic process is called ionosol, um, is just a very simple, straightforward lignin extraction. Very similar to how organosol pulping was done in the 1980s. And it's predicated on the theory that most ionic liquids um, are good at dissolving lignin, but not cellulose. And so rather than try and focus on cellulose dissolution or biomass dissolution, um, we try and do a straightforward lignin extraction. So a large scale solid liquid extraction process. This gives us a very highly pure product, one product, which is cellulose. Um, so all, all of the C6 sugars in a tree, and so roughly 50% um, of the mass of a tree is cellulose about 25% hemicellulose and about 25% lignin. It has a lot of built-in advantages. It gives you a solution of lignin that you could try and valorize, which craft processing or paper making doesn't have that option. Um, it's insensitive to water. In fact, it's, it's quite helped by, by a certain amount of water in the process, which makes um, feedstock drying unnecessary or in fact deleterious. You can use bio-based solvents if you want, depending on how much you're willing to pay for them. 
Um, but the biggest advantage is the one at the bottom. You can design an ionic liquid that would have the same cost as traditional large scale organic solvents. And to put that into context, I know this is an intercollegiate, or sorry, international meeting, but I still did the slide in pounds to let you all remember that I'm, I'm, I'm in the UK. But, um, we started with this question of whether or not ionic liquids could be inexpensive. And the, the battery electrolyte end of the field has been using solvents like the one at the top, butyl methyl imidazolium bistrifluoro or methyl sulfonylamide. Anything with a name that long has got to be complicated and expensive, and it is. As about, it costs about 2,000 pounds a kilo or roughly two million pounds per ton, um, which is very similar to the trading place of silver ore. So it's valuable, um, not exactly something you want to use to produce bioethanol, which sells for around 44 pence a kilogram. That's that's quite a, quite a tough sell. Um, the cellulose dissolving ionic liquids that made the field so famous are the ones in the middle. They're around 40 pounds a kilo. They're still 100 times more expensive than the product. The ones that we developed are about 40 pence, 45 pence a kilo. So they're about half the cost of, of acetone. So we're in the range of bulk organic solvents. And there are lots and lots of different options off of that. And, um, but uh, the, the main point is that, that we decided to redesign the structure to make the solvent cheaper. And that's really the main scientific <laughs> um, advance that we made here, was, was just lowering the cost of the solvent. There's a sustainability angle too. This is how you make one of those battery electrolyte ionic liquids I showed at the top with a really long name. This happens to be the tetrafluoroborate. It takes 29 synthetic steps to produce it. The most complicated organic solvent I'm aware of is a set of nitrile that requires four. So going from four to 29 is, is not very easy. As a result, you get enormous e-factors or enormous waste generation um, because you have to do so many processing steps in your production. Um, the one that we make requires six steps instead of 29. And actually, three of those steps are required to make sulfuric acid, which if you site your biorefinery near a power plant, you can have all the sulfuric acid you want for free. Um, so you don't have to make it. It's a waste product from um, sulfur scrubbing in, in stack acids. Um, this has lowered the cost considerably, and it has knock-on effects. I won't bore you with the, the technical details. Ooh, also, since my reference got cut off there at the bottom, but um, we did a life cycle assessment and showed that, that actually not only is the cost lower, but the environmental impacts are lower. And it's not surprising. If you make the solvent easier to construct, then you will decrease its embedded um, environmental impact. What was more exciting is that we found that the way that you use it will have an impact on how much um, pollution and, and energy generation or CO2 generation um, that you have in the unintended parts of the process, so the use phase. Um, and so actually it's not enough just to make a solvent that's greener, you have to figure out how to make a process that's greener too. This is the other real technical slide and I'm not gonna go into any detail. This is why it's so complicated, it's to scare you. Um, but we've published 400 billion papers on how wonderful this process is. And the point is that it works really well. It gives a few advantages over other options. Um, one is that it produces very pure cellulose. Um, in some cases, we've reported um, cellulose isolated from, from biomass from trees that had a similar purity to cotton cellulose. So ba basically, you could make textile, textiles out of it. Um, the fiber quality is somewhat variable. The lignin recovery is actually quite easy, and you can fractionate it, and you can make exciting things. And, then we started doing engineering stuff. On the right, you can see that as we increase the temperature, the performance of the process is unaffected, but the residence time is greatly shrunk. And so that reduces the capex or the capital expenditure or the capital investment required to build a plant um, by about one and a half orders of magnitude. Um, in the lower left, you can see that as we recycle the solvent, it gets browner and browner, but it still works just the same. And in fact, somewhere in the top middle of the slide, it turns out that it actually works better after it's been conditioned a bit. And so the recycled solvent is more efficient than the non-recycled solvent. So there's lots and lots of exciting things you can do. And nowadays we're making nanocellulose, which you can see the SEM pictures at the top, these nanocrystalline and, and cellulose nanofibers that produce um, out of this process as a, as a byproduct, whereas people historically have <laughs> tried very hard to make them, we sort of get them for free. And so there's a lot of different things that you can do with these. They're exciting. 
Um, but for that, you actually need a process. So it's one thing for me to produce beautiful cellulose in my laboratory, but can we do it at scale? And in order to investigate that, we first started looking at what feedstock to use. And I was quite intrigued by the idea of using a feedstock that nobody else can use. And so we hit upon this idea of metal containing waste wood, so preserved wood. It's usually used in construction. It's called green wood. You can see a picture of it. It's green. Um, it's not green because it's been painted. It's green because it's been impregnated with about half a percent of copper, a half a percent of arsenic, and about a quarter percent of chromium. The copper is to kill fungus. The arsenic is to kill termites. I think the chromium is a binder, but I can't, I can't remember. It's very, very expensive um, to dispose of. There's about 60 million tons a year of it in the US that goes to, to landfill, and about 70 million tons a year in the EU that goes to landfill. Um, in the UK, it has an enormous landfill tax. It's about 130 pounds a ton. So its cost is negative 130 pounds a ton, which normally timber, it sells for about positive 180 pounds a ton. So it's, it's actually, uh, in, in one sense, um, uh, minus 100% of the normal selling cost um, and it can't legally be incinerated so there's no real way to effectively dispose of it but we showed that if you put it through our process that you can not only fractionate the biomass and isolate just as much cellulose as you could if the wood was clean uh, but you can get the metals out to boot so you, you sort of get to get, get solvent cleanup and so three of us who are working on this in the picture there's me uh, my phd student at the time florence in the middle and my postdoc at the time aggie um, on the left decided to form a company in order to see if we could scale this up and that company has gone through several name changes but uh, now it's it's called lixia um, and so you can you can see that uh, uh, the difference between an academic presentation and a, and a commercial one already. I mean, look at how beautiful that picture is. I never have anything that lovely in any of my slides. Um, and so Lixia is devoted to the scale up of that ionosol process, which has been renamed Dendronic, which is quite a quite a really cool name um, in order to, to file for a trademark. And our stated um, mission is to find alternatives to, to fossil based chemical products and fuels um, that are cost competitive. And so how to enable sort of the circular bioeconomy. This is quite a big deal because it's a, a 5 billion um, euro waste material um, that has a 655 billion euro market on the other end of it. And so this quite a nice attraction in mapping um, one bit to the other bit. And you can see the other difference between an academic slides and the sort of commercial ones. Um, I've got all these graphs and SEM images and, uh, you know, weird bits of data, probably a table. You know, I hate tables, so maybe not. Um, instead, we get pictures of corn. I don't know why. There's no corn anywhere in this process, but it's, it's nice. Um, and so the idea basically is to turn these sort of agricultural residues and waste products into something useful and to create revenue and make more sustainability. And like I said, you can see it's sort of more of an investor pitch and less of a scientific talk. And so that, that's sort of the morphing of our thinking is to start thinking of these sort of larger scale opportunities. What are we going to make? So, you know, we've got this lovely process, but it could feed into all of these different industries. But which one do you tackle first? So what's the most exciting commercial opportunity? as opposed to the most exciting academic opportunity. And so this dendronic process um, that we've developed, it's now a pilot scale. Um, it's, it's sort of trying to answer those questions um, from a more of a sustainable economics point of view rather than a sustainable chemistry point of view. And, I, you know, we can allegedly, one of our biggest strengths is that we can handle anything on the feedstock side. So some of that waste wood is absolutely disgusting, post-consumer bits and pieces from destroyed buildings, and then nice clean residues like wheat straw and, and rice straw and sugarcane gas. But the point is these are very large scale materials, sort of petrochemical scale residues, you know, hundreds of millions of tons of agricultural residues um, of each type exist. Um, so there's about 2 billion tons a year of agricultural residue that's left to rot in the field. And so how much of this can be utilized and how best to do it? And those are the main questions. And we've got lots of different product streams that we're looking at, cellulosic fibers, um, resins from lignin, which is one of the main byproduct of biorefining. Um, and then, of course, the, the big chemical and fuel market, which is absolutely enormous and, and always growing. Um, 
and you still retain those same selling points. So you can still kind of see that stuff that was hidden in all those graphs that I showed a minute ago. Um, you know, we can process various different feedstocks, including the really nasty ones. We can use low value waste. We can make high quality lignin and cellulose at the same time, which nobody else can do. So all those sort of advantages that we saw in the laboratory do translate through into the commercial space, but they're pitched quite a bit differently um, rather than spending 20 papers in a, in a journal talking about the lignin NMR results. Um, we do things like put check marks in, in boxes on a, on a slide. And so all of these advantages um, add up to a nice investment opportunity as opposed to a beautiful piece of science. And I, I think that's sort of the change in our thinking that we had to undergo. Oh, look at that picture though. I mean, that's absolutely beautiful. I, was, oh, I wonder how much uh, we had to pay our consultants to make these slides, but they're really nice. Anyway, so we had to do scale up in order to turn this into an actual commercial process. So we had to do some still. So we had to do some engineering. So I said, okay, let's look at intensifying the process. So we want to use less iron and liquid per piece of biomass. So higher solid slurries, so very high solid slurries. Um, larger particle sizes, you know, 10 percent of the current energy input into ethanol production comes from grinding up biomass, which is a total waste because it, it doesn't really accomplish anything, but it's necessary in order to make the process work. So, OK, if the ionic liquids are so aggressive that they can handle anything, what about big chunks? And so we started looking at doing, you know, mass transfer studies and you know, sort of solids handling and washing studies and what happens when you put giant chunks into a reactor and what happens when your reactor gets really, really big and that sort of thing. It was quite interesting. And so um, sort of the foundation of Lixia was to try and answer these questions, because as we went from a test tube to a sort of lab scale reactor to sort of a pilot scale reactor to sort of a plant scale, it was increasingly obvious that these things wouldn't fit into my laboratory. And so it became necessary to form a company in order to study these sort of non-academic questions. And of course, Imperial College has been enormously supportive of me. The Department of Chemical Engineering has, has, has championed our process development the entire time. Um, but we still have to answer academic questions. So I can't have a PhD student study large scale reactor operation because they wouldn't get a PhD out of it. And so we've had to divorce those interests. and. Um, sort of shifting that that sort of thinking is also quite important. What goes into what pot? The person who performed all this, Clementine, there's a, a picture of her. We'll talk more about her in a moment. Um, but she was the student who worked on this. Um, had, again, generated a lot of particle size analysis plots that are very beautiful. But I always think this picture tells the entire story much better than the, the analysis does. Oh, actually, that, that paper's out. I, I need to change that reference. But um, more or less, no matter what you put in, you sort of get the same pulp out. So the, no matter what goes in on the top, no matter what size particle, you get the same pulp out in the bottom. But you'll notice that you start to see more and more undigested bits the larger the particles go. And so the penetration of the ionic liquid into the center of the particles is rate limiting above about the four centimeter scale. That was a very exciting um, finding. Um, you see a picture there of Clementine, and, and she's with um, some uh, uh, families in, in rural India. Um, Clementine sort of went her own direction, so she formed the first spin-out company, um, and, and I, ha I have nothing to do with Orja, but um, uh, it's a company that looks at the production of, uh, or sorry, the creation of solar mini grids in India for farming, basically for farming communities or rural markets. So areas where there is no electrical grid. And so how do you generate electricity for people to use um, sort of at a local level? And it's quite interesting. They they do this entire thing. So they were, they were originally going to do it with biomass gasification, which would have fit perfectly with Clem's PhD. But they figured out in the end that it was much cheaper and faster to do it with solar PVCs. And so she just pivoted completely. Um, I don't know the first thing about uh, solar technology, but, uh, but Clementine is now a, a world expert in it. Um, and they are not an R&D company, so they just buy off the shelf um, solar panels and assemble them in rural farming communities in India and then sell them the electricity cheaper than they can produce it in diesel generators. And so effectively, they lower the cost for the farmers um, so they can do irrigation of, the, irrigation of their crops um, and immensely drop the CO2 footprint of that power generation because there's nothing less efficient than, than burning diesel to make electricity. It's a horrible idea. 
Well, that's a really, really cool idea. Um, and they've had an enormous amount of impact. Um, McClellan's now graduated, and so she runs Orja full time. Um, but they've um, reached hundreds of millions uh, of potential customers, and they have built, I think, 20 grids so far um, in Uttar Pradesh. There are three different districts. They have 28 active products. There you go. So 28 active projects um, that they've built. Um, absolutely incredible. And they've saved so far 32,000 tons of CO2 um, in, in just a, a year and a bit. Absolutely incredible. And all of this costs their customers less than what they were doing before. So it was a money saving thing. So Clem sent these slides along so that I could toss them in there and, and brag about how wonderful she is. But um, that's two spin outs that came off effectively the same project. And in fact, it is the same project. Um, if any of you, since you're all uh, students, most of you are undergraduates, I, I understand. Um, if you have trouble, if you decide you want to do a PhD and you have trouble finding one, um, you should never stress. Clem and Florence, so the founder of Orja and the founder of Lixia, actually both applied for the same position with me. Um, and so theoretically, I had to choose which one of them to hire. Fortunately, it worked out quite well, and we were able to to find enough money to fund both of them. But um, you know, both of them have been on the Forbes under thirty under thirty list. Actually, Clem was on the first one. Um, she was the only one under the age of twenty eight on that list. She was twenty two. Um, absolutely incredible. And she two years ago was named the thirty uh, eighth, I think, on the list of the one hundred most important people in UK India relations. She's still not thirty. Um, and Florence has won several global awards, um, in, including, I always find it quite funny, she won an award last year as the top young engineer in the ICAMI, so the, the Institute for Chemical Engineers, and she's a chemist. Um, so these, these two have been absolutely incredible. And as I said, they, they applied for the same position and the two companies that they spun out came off of the same project. Um, so it's, it's quite a cool story. But if you get rejected from your PhD applications, don't fret, you just might have been up against severe competition. It happens. We had other questions that we had to answer um, as we were trying to build this commercial scale biorefinery process. What do we make the reactor out of? Really simple question, but nobody has ever tried to process 100,000 tons of ionic liquid. So what's the thing going to be made out of? There's no information whatsoever on what alloys are compatible with um, an acidic organic salt at low water concentration. This isn't known. Nobody's ever studied it. So I did what any academic would do. We undertook a corrosion study. And I've shown some data from a sort of a, a publication from a commercial ionic liquid that shows that it is really confusing. And one of the reasons it was really confusing is that the action of the ionic liquid on the steel, this is just quite simple stainless, um, so this is stainless steel 304, but the action of the ionic liquid was really, really unusual. And when Francisco, the student who was doing these, experiments um, started looking at, at base metals so things like zinc which is the, the SEM pictures on the right he found that depending on how much water was in the salt he got a different morphology which is a bit weird uh, I mean this is sort of unheard of in aqueous processing but some of the morphologies um, such as the octagonal uh, crystals in the in B in the top center picture are extremely challenging to produce by any other means and people are in quite high demand for them. And we found them growing on the surface of some samples that we had left sitting in the ionic liquid for a while. Um, and so Francisco, being a, a, a bright young engineer, said, OK, what is this good for? And so he formed a company called Nanomox. And he said, well, fine. Um, if we're not going to understand the impact of ionic liquids on metal alloys, why don't we just use it to our advantage? So why don't we make nanoparticles with controlled morphology something that is not done at large scale at the moment. And so we look at cosmetic and electronic applications, bulk applications like tires, all these things that use metal oxide nanoparticles that normally have to be produced at enormous cost. And again, it's a commercial presentation, so there's no, no nothing, just pretty pictures of coral reefs and a few words that say what we do rather than my, my normal academic rambling. But it's a very, very, very sustainable process. And our big sort of push um, is that this oxidative of thermal synthesis um, can lower carbon emissions considerably from metal oxide production. And in fact, considerably ranges between 92 and 97 percent reduction in CO2 emissions um, compared to autothermal processing um, 
I have to say, if you want to try and reduce CO2 emissions, one thing that you should look at is processes that take place at 1500 degrees Celsius, because it really doesn't take much to have a massive reduction in energy input when your competitors are operating at 1500 degrees. Um, our temperatures range between 30 and 80. And so the difference in, in CO2 emissions as you might expect is considerable. Um, and so we can produce these nice coral reef friendly sunscreen um, additives. Um, it's very, very exciting. So Nanomox is um, just about to go to pilot scale actually with their um, with our particle processing. But basically this whole company popped up because we didn't understand what was going on in our corrosion experiments. Always pay attention to, to weird results, I say. Well, anyway, so back to Lixia. So now we're producing pilot scale amounts. There's me with 200 liters of ionic liquid, um, still, still in the laboratory at Imperial because we made it in the reactor in my lab in the lower left there. Um, and showing that we can recycle the ionic liquid and the metal extraction is never impacted and we can recover the metals and you can do it at large scale and it's very, very exciting. I said, well, does it matter what type of waste would? So rather than this sort of copper chromium arsenic, what if we start looking at paints and, and things? So, you know, lead um, oxide paints or, or titanium um, in paints and, and ionic liquids with, with nails in them and, you know, nickel um, and, and those sorts of things that have come through in terms of the application. And so Ida showed that this actually the metal extraction is, is pretty much independent of metal too. And even up to high loading, so it got cut off at that chart on the right is as a function of how much wood you put into the ionic liquid. And so even when it's half wood and half solvent, you can still get all the metals out. And so that part of the process is basically um, uh, indestructible. Now, Ida couldn't form a company on this because we already had. So she had this side project where she was working on textile recycling. So we were originally trying to do chemical recycling of waste textiles. And what she discovered, almost accidentally, um, was that we were much better at recovering the dyes than we were at recycling the textiles. So we could sort of do both at once, but if we focused on the dyes, we had something really unique. Um, and I said, well, how big a deal is this? You can extract dyes out of clothing. I mean, you know, so what? And I learned a lot of things. Number one, 100% of, of dyes, so it's about 99.92%, but basically 100% of dyes are derived from, from petrochemicals. Um, and so all clothing dyes um, are, are non-natural. 20% of global wastewater pollution, says one fifth of wastewater in the world is from textile dyeing. One fifth of the world's wastewater. That is a horrific total. And so, what if we just did this dyeing without the water? So what if we used the ionic liquid that we were supposed to be using to extract the dyes out of the clothes to put the dyes back into it? Um, and this is sort of a 60 million ton a year um, market in terms of textile waste. Um, 7 million tons a year of pre-consumer textile waste, which is absolutely frightening. That's the amount of stuff that doesn't get sold. Um, so that's sort of uh, stuck in the factories. Um, at the moment, only 1% of textiles are recycled. So 99% are either incinerated or landfill. 1% are recycled. That's terrible. Um, and there is no good method for removing dyes from textile waste. All the techniques that exist right now either use very toxic and flammable solvents or high concentrations of acid, which um, destroys the fibers. And so there isn't anything that's this simple. And as I said, we found that actually, if you pretend that the textile is a piece of biomass and you run it through our biomass fractionation process, um, if you're very gentle about it, you can just fractionate out the dye. And if you take that same ionic liquid solution and you change the conditions, specifically the water content, you can make the dye go back into the fabric. And so you can extract the dye from one piece of fabric and then transfer it into a new piece of fabric. And so you can do sort of a, a dye transfer process. Um, and it's about 90% effective. So about 90% of the dye that comes out goes back in. Um, in principle, this would reduce the amount of version dyes that need to be manufactured by 90%. So it would turn that 20% of global wastewater to 2%. I mean, that, that sort of thing is a big impact.
Um, and we've done it with a lot of different things. Um, so I've shown a picture there. Those are shoelaces. Those are actually Ida's shoes. Um, and she dyed her shoelaces green using um, a, a shirt that she extracted the dye out of. And you can see some of our color swatches. So those are all pieces of fabric where we have used an ionic liquid to remove the dye from textile waste and put it into a new piece of fabric. Um, and so dye recycle um, is a fourth spin out that we had from this sort of biomass processing um, development. I, I said earlier when I was talking about Lixie's economics, the, the economics were really the, the thing that we had to focus on. And, and the last bit of my sort of academic uh, intrigue into this area was, was just how far can you push the economics? We were originally looking at the difference between virgin waste wood and, and uh, sorry, virgin wood and waste wood and found that with waste wood, you could build a smaller biorefinery um, and still be profitable, which is quite exciting because you can retain sort of economies of scale, but you know, it's sort of limited utility. But if you look still at, at agricultural waste or, you know, virgin was just something that isn't recycled um, and you run the process in its most efficient manner, so it's most intensified, the highest solids loading, the lowest temperature, all the yada, yada, yada. Um, we found that we could produce glucose um, for just about 14 pence a kilo. And at the moment, sugar beet syrup or sugar cane syrup in Brazil sells for about two and a half times that. Now, that process is already commercial and ours is still you know, at pilot scale. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that those economics will hold up perfectly. But the point is that for the first time, we had demonstrated that a second generation sugar production could be cost competitive with a first generation sugar production. And you can use almost any biomass to run it as an advantage. So depending on what country or what region you're in, you could choose a different uh, feedstock. And there's nothing magical, to be honest. I mean, the real key to this was that we were brutal about lowering the energy input as much as possible. And so things like steam explosion that requires large scale steam production um, to pre-treat biomass. Um, since we used a salt, we don't ever have to go through a phase change. And so that massively reduces the energy input um, into it. It is a purely solid liquid process. The difficulty that we face, where is it? Oh, it was on this slide. But anyway, the difficulty that we face is that um, we needed to to go back to that that idea at the start. I said about about value, the one the one low value product, so bioethanol. So we needed some co-product valorization, and so I said, okay, okay, what are we going to do with all this hemicellulose? So cellulose is basically a polymer of glucose. So it's a long chain, um, similar to starch, um, but a different configuration, long chain polymer of glucose. Hemicellulose is a somewhat random uh, oligomer of different five carbon and six carbon sugars. Six carbon sugar like glucose has some value as a fermentation feedstock. Five carbon sugars like xylose have no value whatsoever. And in fact, um, if you built a bioethanol, cellulosic bioethanol refinery, you would produce more xylose than the world market demands. So one refinery would flood the world market. So what are we going to do with a thousand refineries worth of silos? So we started looking at things that we could make that involved five carbons and we hit upon this idea, okay, what if we started making surfactants? Um, petrochemical surfactants dominate the industry at the moment and they're based on benzene. Well, we can easily turn those xylose uh, structures, which are on the left, into um, into furans. And then we can sort of couple those furans with things like fatty acids, and you can make a bio-based surfactant. So you could replace shampoos and um, laundry detergents and all sorts of different uh, cleaning products um, with, with bio-surfactant. And the advantage of that is that the consumer products industry is desperate to try and get more and more bio-derived products into their, uh, bio-derived feedstocks into their products. They're trying to move away from petrochemical feedstocks and into bio-based feedstocks, whatever they can do. And so we formed this company, which actually hasn't officially launched yet, but um, it will be launching in the next few weeks, called BioAtorexis, which is a great name, um, which produces EcoSaf, which is our economically friendly sulfonated alkyl furor 08, um, which is sort of a waste product turned into a surfactant for detergents and personal care products. And the real principle of this, as I said, is to replace these sort of benzene derived 
products like LAS or linear alkyl benzene sulfonates, um, which are petrochemical based, low water soluble, um, non biodegradable uh, uh, surfactants that dominate the industry. And so we have developed highly biodegradable, non toxic versions of this using um, sugar based chemistry. And weirdly enough, for the first and only time probably in my entire career, it actually works better. And so on top of everything else, it's a better surfactant than the ones that you get um, with the, the benzene head group. I don't know why. Um, we've been looking at this quite a bit, but it doesn't make much sense to me. I see no reason to believe that it would have been better. Uh, I, as a sort of reflex, I figured that they would be inferior in quality because most bio-derived products are inferior to petrochemical analogs, but this time they're actually better. Um, and we've actually done this, we, we've made kilos of it. We haven't quite gotten to ton scale, but we've made kilos of it um, in order to supply it to different partners for testing. And we've been working with some very large scale um, personal care product uh, companies in order to figure out if they can sort of just sort of drop this in to their existing formulations. But this whole idea came out of trying to figure out what to do with hemicellulose. We've got great markets for cellulose. We've got some idea of what to do with lignin. Uh, but we really had no idea what to do with the hemicellulose. And so each and every one of those companies came off some part of this process flow screen, this uh, flow scheme that we published in 2017. Um, you know, sort of the, the pre-treatment was Lixia and, and you know, the, the biomass processing led to Orgia and the materials of subtraction led to Nanomox and on and on and on. Um, but it was all one project. And we just started looking at, at different solutions to, to various problems in our own supply chain. And the last one, which I'm not, I'm not really going to talk about, was was the sewage sludge. So what do you do with the wastewater out of this process? And uh, because we're working with metal containing feedstocks, we have metal containing wastewater, which actually is quite a common problem in wastewater processing. They end up with a lot of, you'd be surprised at what goes uh, on in the sewage system, but <laughs> there's a lot of things like mercury and lead and uh, cadmium that build up um, sort of in, in wastewater treatment. And so we found that we could we could use the same process to de demetallize or detoxify sewage sludge, so it could be used as land spread. So we, of course, did exactly what we seem to do all the time in my research group. We formed a spin-out company to take advantage of that ionic recovery, which is that I think I was no longer being very original with names. So ionic liquid recovery. So yeah, ionic recovery. Very boring name. I'm sorry. So I think the the conclusion of this is that. OK, I usually say academic conclusion. I don't think we don't have to be expensive. You can be really smart about how to run a process if you really think about what you need to do and delignify biomass rather than dissolved cellulose and blah, 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 blah. But I was hoping to give you some idea today about how scale up considerations differ from traditional academic research and how those sorts of things can lead to entrepreneurial ideas. And the last one that, that I'll, I'll mention is, is the one thing that we haven't yet quite cracked is the largest operating expenditure. I mentioned the largest capital expenditure was the pretreatment. The largest operating expenditure as you go from biomass to ethanol is the enzymes. And so we started working on enzyme stabilization um, a few years ago, about five years ago. And how could we do the enzyme hydrolysis in the ionic liquid instead of in water? So take water out of the cellulose to sugar process. Um, Without immobilizing the enzymes, this was the trick. And it was a big challenge and everybody thought we were nuts. I thought we were nuts. And it worked great, but it worked a little too well. And I started saying, okay, we stabilized some enzymes and they worked outside of water and they were stable to about 220 degrees Celsius instead of 50. So I said, okay, this is great. They're really, really stable. Where would you want stable proteins besides bioprocessing? And I hit upon this idea of vaccine stabilization. And trying to eliminate the cold chain. And we started working on using ionic liquids as preservation agents for first um, protein-based vaccines and then later RNA-based vaccines so that you could eliminate the, the concept of a cold chain. So at the moment, you have to store most vaccines. So a, a couple of years ago, nobody would have understood what I was talking about, but now everybody does. But you have to store some vaccines at temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius, which is an enormous problem for most of the world. It's great when you live in London like I do. It's not a problem. We've got minus 80 degree freezers everywhere. It's not so easy if you live in a rural village in Central Africa. It's a very difficult place to get minus 50 degree temperatures. Um, 
And I talked a, moment, a while ago about Clementine and the rural villages in India. It's the same idea. No electricity, no cold storage. Um, and I went and talked about this concept in, in Davos at the World Health Forum in January of 2019. And we're sitting there talking about disease X. What if there was a global pandemic tomorrow for a disease that had previously been unseen? And I always think it's funny because we talked about that in January of 2019 and 10 months later, there it was. Um, I wish it had been three years later because we would have been ready for it, but instead we were caught a little off guard. But um, we're probably going to have to form another spin out for this because the vaccine companies love this idea of room temperature storage. And um, RNA vaccines are stable for about two hours at room temperature. And with our ionic liquids inside them, they're stable for at least 60 days at room temperature. So two hours, 60 days. That's a big jump. Anyway, that's it. I'm I'm talked out, so I hope you I hope you enjoyed part of it. Thank you Thank so you much, so much. Uh, uh, Alex, for, for presenting this uh, incredibly important topic. Uh, I'm certainly going to be reading a lot more about ionic liquids coming up soon, and I, I imagine many of members of the audience will be as well. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, and first, we'll be starting with one from Justine Pearson from South Africa. Um, she also commented the Lexia graphic content is indeed beautiful, and I agree. Um, of course, the question is, uh, what are the dendronic processes, average performance differences between lab scale and pilot scale in terms of yield efficiency, that sort of thing? Uh, it, 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 it's hard to answer that in absolute terms. In some, with some, bi it is really biomass feedstock dependent, I guess. So it, with some biomasses, the yields are reduced by about 20%. And with some, they are unchanged. I haven't seen any where they're actually higher than the pilot scale, but the you know, hope springs eternal in that. I have to say the pilot scale process doesn't approach that problem in the way that you might think. So we don't, we don't, we basically adjust the conditions until the performance is as close to the lab scale as possible. And so I would say, to be honest, it's not the performance that changes all that much. It's it's actually the process that changes a lot. And so the um, pilot scale version of this process runs at lower temperature um, and longer residence times in order to achieve the same output. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's it is a lot lot different in terms of how it looks, um, but the, the performance in the end is about the same. Another question is, how do you manage your time between being a professor and being co-founder partner of so many different companies and do things often overlap? I mean, badly. Um, they do often overlap. This is not a terrible example of it right now, right? Am I representing Imperial College or Lixia or what have you? I think I think nominally I'm representing Lixia today, but uh, you know there there is some overlap in terms of when I when I talk to, to, to people about the the research that we've done. We talk about different aspects and different venues, but but there is there is some overlap. Um, no, it's it's difficult. So I have adjusted the things that I do within the university, and my boss has been very nice to me, and he has allowed me to do fewer administrative tax tasks within the department um, in exchange for spending more time with my spin-out companies. Um, but it it is quite a balance, and um, you know, spin-out companies don't have any money, so you know. Could they, they, you know, they can't exactly pay me very much. So you, know, you ha have to sort of figure out a way to, to I guess, fracture your time and, and um, devolve as many tasks as possible. Uh, I don't run any of those spin-outs. I help run four of them, but I don't run any of them. I don't. I work full time for Imperial College and Lixia gets about one day a week. They're the most out of, out of any any of the others. The rest of them are even lower. Another question we have um, is some published papers debate the claim that ionic fluids are truly less toxic than other organic solvents due to specific ecotoxicity. Uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, it's very specific. So um, uh, yeah, it depends on which one you use. So unfortunately, with as with any field, um, the field moves on and the I don't know what's the ancillary information takes a long time to catch up. 
Um, this is a great example. So the solvents that we were using, <laughs> the adic liquids that we were using 10 years ago are the ones that are now undergoing ecotoxicity studies, and they're quite toxic, and I'm not surprised. We quit using them 10 years ago because we knew that they were quite toxic. Um, so we said, okay, let's use a different ones. So it'll take a while to catch up. Um, the solvent that we've used is not ecotoxic. So that was one of the first things that we checked because we're going to have to go through REACH registration. So um, we had to check all of the sort of fundamentals of that. But sure, it, it is, uh, whenever you talk about um, solvent usage, the, the sort of the disposal is the key, right? So, you know, if, if workers in a plant are exposed to a solvent, the plant has got much bigger problems than the ecotoxicity of the solvent, right? So the problems that arise are not through leakages and, and those things, because that's a, that's a process safety consideration. Those are usually taken care of. They're very, very, very rare. The problems come from accidental spillage, wastewater emissions, those sorts of things. Um, and there it makes a huge difference which ionic liquid you use. Um, the ones that are used, as I said, as battery electrolytes are horrific. I, I don't know why people even bothered in the first place. The ones that we use are almost edible. They're very close. The ones that we use in the vaccine formulations are edible. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, yeah, you have to sort of pick and choose um, what your application is. I wouldn't eat the ones we use in the biomass process, though. They're a little, they're a bit acidic. So maybe indigestion. Fair, but certainly going against all the uh, lab techniques we've always heard and all the lab rules, but not eating things in the lab. Uh, another question we have uh, from Steve from Melbourne uh, is, when and how do you decide to translate a research project into a startup? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, usually you hit a wall in the laboratory, and that wall is normally your ability to carry on demonstrating that the thing works. And I'll give you a pretty easy example because um, ECOSAF, the, the surfactant just went through this. So we made in the laboratory, we made, um, I don't know, a few kilos, two or three kilos of the surfactant, which is enough for any company to run tests on. So it's plenty for us to send to company X that makes shampoo and, and let them see how it would perform in their formulation. But the solvent that we make in the laboratory is done the sulfonation of the furan is done using chlorosulfonic acid, which is a classic organic chemistry technique that gives extremely pure products. It is not commercially relevant because chlorosulfonic acid is too expensive to use at scale, so nobody ever would. So well, how do they do it in industry? They use a falling film sulfonation reactor with SO3. Can I do that in my laboratory? No, can't be done. I cannot build a miniature falling film sulfonation reactor. Can't be done, it wouldn't work. Or it would work. It would work too well, to be honest. So you can't study the mass transfer limitations in a falling film reactor unless your falling film reactor is of a sufficient size. And so we kind of have to form a company just to show that we can scale up the process aspects that at the moment I'm doing academically to show that they would work if they were done commercially. And you know, the, the classic phrase for this is about technical grade, right? So what we are producing right now is research grade. Um, surfactant, and we want to produce technical grade surfactant. The other case where you would need to form a spin out, the thing that has launched most of my spin outs in the end is that somebody wanted to give us money. Right, so people don't invest in research. They might, they might give us grants, but they're not going to invest in research. So once somebody wanted to invest in the technology, we had to form a company in order to sell equity. And that is usually the, the big trigger is somebody wants to give us some money. So we need a bank account. And so we form a company, company in order to have a bank account. Uh, and then one other question I'll combine, one last one, um, really from two people, but essentially, what are your tips on how you thought of so many ideas for companies? Or like, what is your secret for starting so many companies? Um, Well, I mean, there's the, the the flippant answer, and then there's the, the sort of the, the more the more thoughtful answer. But the flippant answer is, is I, I wouldn't say that I really did. My students did, right? So my students are crazy, and so I, I don't know if they're just allergic to the idea of working for somebody else or or what. You know, they they don't want to bother with a job search, so they want to form a company instead. I don't know, but um, most of the time, that that's the real differentiating factor. Well, I think we've got plenty of ideas that we could turn into technology companies. But you need a person to drive that forward. And what distinguishes a company like Lixia or a company like Orja 
from a lot of other spin-outs that are Florence and Clementine. So it's the people behind it, right? If you've got really, really ambitious, energetic, um, bright, uh, uh, opportunistic people, um, you can go a long ways with a company. What I have done, I would say, the only thing I would have done compared to most of my academic colleagues in, in sort of chemical engineering departments across the world who have fewer spin-outs, um, is try to encourage that sort of thinking. And so most of the time when we work on problems, we think about how it might translate. And sometimes it's like, OK, we could demonstrate this and we'd have to do, do a company to scale up. And sometimes it's like, well, OK, maybe, maybe we, if we do this well enough, we can convince BASF to just buy it. And so it isn't always about us wanting to form a spin out. In, in my case, my only motivation is to try and get impact. Right? I could have done anything. You know, if I had, I, I actually quite fascinated with things like nuclear fusion. Right. If I just wanted to be a scientist, this is not what I would have chosen to do. Right? So the reason that I chose to do this instead of try and figure out what makes electrons collide is to uh, is because um, I thought that we could have a real impact here. So I thought this was something that could make a difference in the world in a time frame that I would be able to recognize it. And so the, the environment that I think we've created in, in our laboratory is that people think about how their research, my students think about how their research might have impact. Very important point. Um, so I believe we're reaching the time for the, the end of our session. Uh, and so to everyone listening, thank you for being a great audience. And I hope you've enjoyed this amazing presentation. Uh, you can now head on over to the next session where you'll hear about how engineers can help deal with the environmental issues that we're facing today in a talk given by Dale Rautenbach. Uh, you can also go to the wonder.me link to meet and network with students who have been attending this talk or the conference in general. And I've put both uh, links in the Q&A chat. Uh, a big thank you once again to Professor Hallett and the audience, and I hope you all have a rest, uh, wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.